as we've been talking about, the coronavirus is very real and very scary, and it's especially scary for children who may or may not understand. My children, Layla, eight here, and my son, Mateo, seven at home, um, often ask if they will catch COVID, and if they do, will they die? Um, they are watching as others get the vaccine, and they would like to know when will kids be able to get the vaccine? Well, first of all, honey, what was your first name? Layla. Layla. Layla, beautiful name. First of all, Kids don't get the vaccine, get COVID very often. It's un unusual for that to happen. They don't, they, and the evidence so far is children aren't the people most likely to get COVID, number one. Number two, the, we haven't even done tests yet on children as to whether or not the certain vaccines would work or not work or what is needed. So that's, you, you're, you're the safest group of people in the whole world, number one. Number two, you're not likely to be able to be exposed to something and spread it to mommy or daddy. And it's not likely mommy and daddy are able to spread it to you either. So I wouldn't worry about it, baby, I promise you. But I know it's kind of worrisome. Are you, what, are you in first grade, second grade? Second. Oh, so you're getting old. <laughs> second grade. Well, have, has your school, have you been in school, honey? No, Nowhere see, that's, a, that's kind of a scary thing, too. You don't get to go to school. You don't get to see your friends. And so what a lot of kids, and I mean, and big people, too, older people, they just, their whole lives have sort of changed like when it used to be. You used to be able to just go outside and play with your friends and get in the school bus and go to school and everything was normal. And now when things change, people get really worried and scared. But don't be scared, honey. Don't be scared. You're going to be fine. And we're going to make sure mommy's fine, too. You know, let me ask you. <laughs> let, me let me ask you, just for folks who are watching out there, there are a lot of people who are scared. And there's a lot of people who are sure. hurting. When do you think this pandemic is, I mean, when, are we, when is it going to be done? When are we going to get back to normal? Well, you know, uh, all the experts, uh, all the committee that I put together with the leading uh, researchers in the world in the United States are on this committee of mine, uh, headed by Dr. Fauci and others. Uh, um, they tell me, be careful not to predict things that you don't know for certain what's going to happen because then you'll be held accountable. I get that. But let me tell you what I think based on all that I've learned and all that I've studied and all that I think that I know. It's fairly, it's a high probability that the vaccinations that are available today and the new one, Johnson & Johnson, God willing, will prove to be useful, mm -hmm. that with those vaccinations, the ability to continue to spread the disease is going to diminish considerably because of what they call herd immunity. And now they're saying somewhere around 70% of the people have to constitute. Some people said 50, 60, but a significant number have to be in a position where they are, they have been vaccinated and or they've been through it and have stopped, antibodies and have antibodies. Um, and so if that works that way, as my mother would say, with the grace of God and the goodwill of the neighbors, that by next Christmas, I think we'll be in a very different circumstance, God willing, than we are today. I think a year from now, when it's 22 below zero here, um, no, a year from now, I think that there'll be significantly fewer people having to be socially distanced, have to wear masks, et cetera, but we don't know. So I don't want to overpromise anything here. I told you when I ran and when I got elected, I will always level with you. To use Franklin Roosevelt's example, I'll shoot you, give it straight from the shoulder, straight from the shoulder what I know and what I don't know. We don't know for certain, but it is highly unlikely that by the beginning of next year's school, traditional school year in September, we are not significantly better off than we are today. But it matters. It matters whether you continue to wear that mask. 
It matters whether you continue to socially distance. It matters whether you wash your hands with hot water. It, those things matter. They matter. And that can save a lot of lives while we're getting to this point where you get to herd immunity. Um, you've made... You made passing a COVID relief bill uh, the focus of your first 100 days. Those on the right say the proposal's too big. Some on the left say it's not big enough. Are you committed to passing $1.9 trillion bill, or is that final number still up for negotiation? I'm committed to pass. Look, here's some of you are probably economists or college professors or you teach it in school. This is the first time in my career and as you can tell, I'm over 30. The first time in my career that there is a consensus among economists, left, right, and center, that is over, and including the IMF and in Europe, that the overwhelming consensus is in order to grow the economy a year, two, three, and four down the line, we can't spend too much. Now's the time we should be spending. Now's the time to go big. You may recall I managed the last experiment we had with the stimulus, and it was 800, no, I don't mean it that way, but it was $800 billion. We thought we needed more than that, and we think we did. We got, we were, it ended up working, but it slowed things up by about, and depending who you talk to, between six months and a year and a half. We can come back, we can come roaring back. It's estimated that if we, by most economists, including Wall Street firms, as well as, as, as uh, you know, uh, think tanks of uh, political think tanks, left, right, and center, it is estimated that if you, we pass this bill alone, we'll create seven million jobs this year. Seven million jobs this year. And so, the thing we haven't talked about, and I'm not going to go on because I want to hear your question, I apologize. We haven't talked about, I remember you and I talking during the campaign, and you had the former guy saying that, well, you know, uh, we're just going to open things up, and that's all we need to do. And we said, no, you got to deal with the disease before you deal with, the, with getting the economy going. Well, the fact is that the economy now has to be dealt with. And what is it? Look at all the people. You have over 10 million people unemployed. We need unemployment insurance. We need to make sure that, you know, you have 40% of the children in America are talk about food shortage, 60% of it. Did you ever think you'd see a day in Milwaukee? You'd see in the last six months people lining up in their automobiles for an hour or for as far as you could see to get a bag of food? What, I mean, this is the United States of America, for God's sake. We can't deal with that. We promised, look at all the people who are on the verge of being kicked out of their apartments because they cannot afford, they cannot afford the rent. What happens when that happens? Everything, look at all the mom and pop landlords that are in real trouble if we don't subsidize this in the meantime. Look at all the people who are on the verge of missing and how many people have missed their last two mortgage payments and are able to be foreclosed on. That's why I took executive action to say they cannot be foreclosed on in the meantime. Because look at what the impact on the economy would be. You think it's bad now, let all that happen. Look at all the people who have lost their insurance. How many, I'm not asking for a show of hands, how many of you had jobs with co corporations or companies that provided health care, the Cobra health care? Well, guess what? The company goes under, and guess what? You lose your health insurance. Well, we should be making sure you're able to pay for that so that we keep people moving. So there's a lot. So I think bigger and the vast majority of the serious people say bigger is better now, not spending less. This is, uh, this is Randy Lang, an independent who supported Donald Trump uh, in 2020. Randy's the co-owner of a woodworking company here in Milwaukee. Randy, welcome. Good evening. Uh, you're proposing a $15 minimum wage. Given the lower cost of living specifically in the Midwest, many business owners are concerned that this will put them out of business, forcing them to downsize or cut benefits. How can you instill confidence in small businesses that this will benefit the Midwest business growth? Well, first of all, the South is not much different than the Midwest in that regard as well. But here's the thing. 
If you look back over the last 40 years, as minimum wages increased, people haven't, the end, the end result of net employment hasn't changed. The vast majority of the economists, and there's studies that show that by increasing the minimum wage to $15 an hour, it could have an impact on, on a number of businesses, but it would be de minimis, et cetera. Here's the deal. It's about doing it gradually. We're at $7.25 an hour. No one should work 40 hours a week and live in poverty. No one should work 40 hours a week and live in poverty. But it's totally legitimate for small business owners to be concerned about how that changes. For example, if it went, if we gradually increased it, when we indexed it at 720, if we kept it indexed by, to, to inflation, people would be making 20 bucks an hour right now. That's what it would be. The Congressional Budget Office s says that a $15 minimum wage would lift 900,000 people out of poverty, but would also cost 1.4 million people their jobs. Is that yes, but there's also, if you read that whole thing about Pinocchios and all the rest, mm -hmm. there are also equal number of studies say that's not a, that wouldn't have that effect. And particularly as you do it in terms of how gradually you do it. So let's say you said you're going to increase the minimum wage from $7.25 an hour between now and the year 2025 to, to $12 an hour, to $13 an hour. You double someone's pay, and the impact on business would be absolutely diminished, and it would grow the GDP, and it would grow and it would gen generate economic growth. But it's not illegitimate as a small business person to worry about whether or not increasing it at one fell swoop would have that impact. I do support a $15 minimum wage. I think there is equally as much, if not more, evidence to dictate that it would grow the economy and long run and medium run benefit small businesses as well as large businesses, and it would not have such a, uh, a dilatory effect. But that's a debatable issue.